This is San Francisco. I am Toshio Moronic. I am a journalist who has done a lot of writing about politics here in the Bay and beyond. And I also have a book that is out in early 2023. However, you can pre-order it from anywhere you might get your books or versobooks.com. It is called Miss Major Speaks and it's about the uh, life and legacy of a Black trans revolutionary that I happen to know I also have here with me today. <laughs> My name is Kristen Siafi. I live in San Francisco, friend of Toshio. I organize surrounding a variety of issues in the Bay Area, especially around housing justice and being a hater. We'll talk more about that this episode, but feel free to follow me on Twitter at JF, like Frank Christ, like Jesus underscore to hear more of my opinions and complaints about EMBs and imperialism. And I know you have some excellent complaints. Thank you. Thank you. I have a lot. Welcome to San Francisco. And today's story is about the Yimbi movement which is the fake grassroots anti-affordable housing quote-unquote activist movement that is funded by billionaires who are making money off real estate and tech. And it's a movement that uses trickle-down Reaganomics to tell lies about something all of us need, which is shelter. And the movement is here to tell the rest of us that we are too stupid to understand how housing works, so we should leave it to them and their experts. ZMBs are only comparable to uh, Zionists and the fervor that they come for people that dare to question their simplistic read of uh, the housing crisis, the housing unaffordability crisis, the crisis of a lot of the property being owned by very few people, not just in San Francisco, but globally, as more and more the uh, real estate market is dominated by these huge corporations like BlackRock, which we'll get to in a second. I guess I could start with asking whether or not you, Kristen, and I guess, you know, you, the audience out there, has ever looked up at uh, new condo buildings on a regular night in San Francisco or actually most U.S. cities because the lights will often be out in these buildings that have been built in the last few years. And that's because they're empty. I they're will say that like one of my favorite pastimes, I mean, it's actually kind of a horrible pastime because it does make you a little feel some type of way. But uh, I personally love looking at condos at night because it really just lays it out for how much fucking empty space you have people just sitting on for the just for the sake of raking in money. Right. They're only getting better at, you know, making sure that they, they've hired security guards to guard said empty space that are on the clock full time. And I mean, the defensive architecture game has gone up quite a bit, I would say, here in San Francisco. Mm -hmm. These are not places that you can squat. These are, you know, in model home condition, basically. Never been touched, never been slept in kind of houses that are sitting on the market. And right now, it seems like that is uh, only going to continue because luxury condos continue to be built, even though there are fewer people that can afford them than just a couple of years ago, pre-pandemic, when the real estate market was uh, on another tear climbing to these ridiculous heights of sale prices where you'd have to bid like far far above whatever the asking price was 
if you're if you're buying a place and then if you're renting a place i mean i remember a couple times just moved to san francisco going to these open houses and trying to like get in a handshake and make a good impression on the roommates that you were going to be living with it was like worse than a job interview i would say yeah i cannot fucking imagine i mean just like the idea i've been like close to going to meet with houses like shared houses and presenting myself and it just sounds so fucking daunting if you're not white and not a tech worker your chances are probably slim and if you're queer that's probably a whole other story yeah not only do you have to qualify for the extremely high rents but you also have to (coughs) kind of prove that you are going to be a good tenant and part of that tends to be what color is your skin how do you present like it's very it's very tied to that especially when you're talking about these corporate landlords which again a few corporations are are buying up more and more of the rental housing stock, even as like more and more people are having to rent because my generation, you're a bit younger. And I think anyone in their 20s, 30s is not really like thinking that seriously about being able to buy a house. Right. At least not in in a place like San Francisco, where you can be near your community that you've lived around for years and perhaps has like basic public transportation, (laughs) you can walk to restaurants, like, I don't know, things that I think shouldn't come at such a premium. Um, Yeah, so if you look up at the new condo buildings on any given night, in most US cities, the lights will be out because they're empty. As of 2022, there are at least 61,000 empty homes in San Francisco. And this is according to city data. The city data also says there are uh, 4,300 houseless people. So that means there are about 15 empty D homes for every houses person that the city has officially declared as part of the counted ho- houseless. Um, the city does these like uh, houses counts every year, and they just uh, more recently people have been looking at the data around empty homes, and it's pretty clear there are a lot, a lot of vacant houses that people could move into but of course they're just still outrageously expensive at market rate and or above and even what's considered below market rate can still be expensive and yeah there's just this idea that's spreading like wildfire that with all of this surplus of condos of empty housing that it's just going to drive everything down and it's exactly the opposite yeah new condos just make things more expensive in a neighborhood we're talking about yimbis today and one of the basic tenets of their religion (laughs) around housing has to do with this idea that things will trickle down that if you build more and you have more empty condos that everything is going to get affordable for people And it's just not the case. We should probably talk for people who don't know what it means uh, about what what YIMBY actually is short for, which is yes in my backyard, or as in yes, build luxury condos in my backyard. YIMBYs believe or say that they believe that more supply will end the problem of demand for housing. Their funding and their people uh, mainly come from the real estate industry and the tech industry, and they are an attempt to solve the image problem that the real estate industry has in 2022. The real estate industry continues to increase the number one cost of living that we all have to deal with unless we're super, super rich, which is having a roof over our heads. You and I, I think, would both agree landlords are scum and they have a problem on their hands like 
there are more and more of us who share that belief. So they need to rebrand. They need to have some sort of PR makeover. And I've seen a lot of landlords online and then you know, there's videos of landlords just demanding to be called housing providers at like city council meetings. Can we just like also, I'll, I'll just like throw this in really quick. I am seeing more and more and like literal content uh, being driven at people from landlords, especially like social on media. Content? Yeah, yeah. Especially on TikTok, you know, you have landlords that are like, oh, uh, we evicted this this family and now they've just absolutely trashed my property. Oh, and you have, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and you have people just totally coming to the, at the defense of the, the landlord, the slumlord. That is a thing. In yeah. 2022 is the, I, I feel like it's been the year of self-victimizing landlords. Like the landlords finally found their voice to speak out about the problem that they've been having with years and years of just collecting rent from people and, you know, never even having to, in many cases, go and see these properties. In many cases, they won't have met the people that live there. And talking about like small time landlords, but the truth is we are in a place where the houses that are being bought to be rented out are not by these quote unquote mom and pop landlords that the Yimbies always like to point to as victims in the housing crisis wars. But these corporate landlords, you don't know who you're dealing with. In many cases, you won't, you won't ever meet the people who own the building because in many cases, it's like some kind of fund based in New York or who knows, like Beijing or Geneva. And they are basically just an investment firm who have interests in countries around the world. They don't have actual contacts with the, their tenants. They're just, they're just raking in the money. That's so slimy, but uh, you know, I can't say, I can't say I'm surprised. So, you know, this is like coming to light more and more. And as more and more of us who are not extremely rich understand that the basic need of shelter shouldn't be this thing that the free market decides. We have got a lot of people out there wondering why do we have a situation where the free market is controlled by these megalomaniacs who have black holes where their hearts should be? Why is the housing market also controlled for the most part by these same people? Some of the protections that we have here in San Francisco, like rent control, that's, that's rare. Most cities do not have rent control, which is, you know, this thing where if you live in certain buildings in San Francisco, it's by no means all renters have access to this. And every new condo building that goes up, rent control doesn't exist for that building. Rent control means that you are not going to year to year see your rent go up some exorbitant amount and the landlords have to agree to contracts that only allow them to tie the rent increases to things like, you know, inflation or an increase in local incomes. And so as these housing providers are looking to rebrand, Yimbies are the one tool that keeps coming up as this cover for the fact that the real estate industry is the top funder of local politicians in almost any city across the U.S. The real estate industry is in many ways like oil and energy companies or factory farms. Like we have really negative connotations, I think, at least locally for these things. But in particular, around the environment. I mean, real estate developers are one of the biggest contributors to global warming. Again, we're moving towards just a few of these huge corporations owning most of the housing and making the decisions around like how the construction works. I'm not arguing that what we need is more, you know, they have these green certifications for buildings like LEED, LEED is, is one of them. Developers want to develop 
new buildings, which is incredibly bad for the environment, incredibly more expensive than repurposing already existing buildings. Yes. New buildings in San Francisco are not subject to rent control. So renters there are SOL at the end of the year when the landlord decides, I want to raise the rent by a lot. Yeah, you know, we'll probably talk more about like uh, BMR, below market rate units. For a lot of condos, the developers have to include a certain percentage of below market rate units. And what ends up happening, I mean, because like they're not protected under a sort of rent control, the developers, the landlords, the owners of these condos can just raise it up anyway the yeah. following year. Like it happens all the time. There's also a lot of times where people do have the opportunity to live in these buildings, but also are subject to really racist housing policies that are usually like instituted, you know, by the developers, by the owners. I really wanted to touch on the thing you mentioned about the real estate industry and developing is such a threat to the environment because YIMBYs, they are self-proclaimed liberal or sometimes like libertarian, uh, democratic, Mm -hmm. whatever, this neoliberal umbrella. And obviously most of them are for sustainability and green activism. You have a lot of people, yeah, that are, you know, identify as like, I'm a, I'm a cyclist. I bike. Uh, yes, and yeah. there's like a the San Francisco bike coalition to Yimby pipeline, it feels like sometimes. Oh my God. Yeah. Like bike culture out here is just totally fucked up. And I, I could talk all day about how much I hate bike culture today, but it's almost alarming how many people are willing to uphold this ideology. To me, it's an I- ideology because or a cult, uh, truly. There's tons of these buildings horribly made and feel like dorm rooms, destroy yeah. the fucking air and like all of these things. Like they're just so, they're, it's not green. It's not, there's nothing sustainable about development. It's like a big argument that Yimbis make, you know, we need to bulldoze what exists and build more density, which of course is beneficial to developers and the real estate industry because the denser a building is, that means like more people and more dollar signs. There is like this idea, of course, in technology, like planned obsolescence. It's the idea that like companies are making your iPhone shittily or whatever phone you got uh, shittily (laughs) so that you have to continue to buy one and you can't like hang on to it for an extended amount of time. I mean, yeah, so planned obsolescence is this rule that, you know, in some cases, of course, it might sound like a conspiracy, but companies do do this where they are building these things just to, to break after a certain amount of time. There is a case in Western Edition in San Francisco of maybe all public housing that was built just 20 years ago. And I mean, it's been years that people living there have been complaining to the city, to the you know Department of Building Inspections that this place isn't fit for living in because it was not built that way. It was built to last like five, 10 years so that maybe the same developer could come back and get that contract because so many of these like contracts are based around like nepotism and political favors, et cetera. So the city is suing over uh, the several hundred units in Western Edition that, you know, were contracted developer. It just... They, they were so poorly made that they're not fit to live in just 20 years later. These are not forever homes, that's for sure. So there are these companies like BlackRock, which is not unique from other real estate monster corporations, you know, owning hundreds of thousands of homes around the world. BlackRock, I remember it struck me in particular when in 2020, just as the COVID pandemic was starting, they took uh, $300 million from the uh, investments, uh, or the the investors rather, that uh, they were working with some subset of them, because this is a huge company that doesn't just deal in real estate. 
Anyway, they set it aside to buy the homes of people that it forecasted, BlackRock forecasted, would be broke and lose their homes and have to sell them on the cheap or even, you know, they were expecting the body count. So they would be able to snap up the homes of people who actually died. Pretty grim. If you have heard of anybody who's trying to actually purchase a home, they're up against these massive companies like BlackRock that basically have unlimited money compared especially to your average like individual who's trying to buy a house. These are companies that can pay in all cash. And they're also able to access these tech-based algorithms and data to know exactly what to bid so that they can beat out any of the normies, the regular people who are trying to buy a house, but not buy too much so that they can keep on keeping their profits up. So, you know, enter, you know, companies like, like Zillow and Redfin that collect a lot of this data and then sell it to companies like BlackRock who use math to like kind of just outbid other buyers. You know, one of the ways that landlords and developers and urban planners have found to combat the image problem is this idea that the MB is encapsulate which is the faux grassroots movement that benefits their desire to develop and build, build, build. I and many other people became aware of uh, someone named Sonia Trouse a few years back, who is the daughter of a landlord. Sonia owns a house in San Francisco and is married uh, to a man, Ethan, who owns an East Bay and also owns a cafe out there. She arrived from Philadelphia a few years ago, 2010s. She was coming with a, a record and a restraining order taken out against her by a neighbor in South Philly, where she was from. She moved to South Philly in her 20s. The neighbor had lived there for years, ran a print shop with some printing machines that got loud sometimes. Sonia didn't like this. She threatened the dude and was living in a house owned by her parents next door. Uh, her parents are these landlords who kind of, it seemed, sent their daughter on a colonial mission to South Philly. I think she's a perfect example of the type of people that the real estate industry is uh, sort of using willingly on their part to do this dirty work of creating these fake movements for more development. With help from generational wealth, uh, Sonia started to clean up the area. Her dad bought another much larger property than the one she was living in. Actually, it was a hotel. She made sure to get rid of the people who her dad called losers and junkies who had been living there. Later, as she travels west to the Bay Area, and she soon started appearing at the San Francisco Planning Commission, which is this bureaucratic commission that decides what gets built and what doesn't. What really just absolutely kills me is that I know Sonia Trouse, you know, behind yeah. this podcast, I love talking shit about Sonia <laughs> Trouse. Um, I'll just leave that there. Um, but you, when you lay it all out, like her brief background before coming to the Bay Area, this woman is like a total nightmare neighbor through and through. Well, she's definitely That's the type of person that, absolutely. yeah, has 311 on speed dial. I really want to meet this neighbor, this Philly neighbor of hers. Um, I would love to know more details about what the fuck went down there, but please continue. After coming out West, pioneer that she is, <laughs> she's shown up to the hearings where the public can ostensibly, you know, say whether or not they support a new building proposal or they don't. And like most of these city hall commission meetings, it is stacked with a bunch of people who, in this case, come from the real estate industry or maybe are architects and stand to benefit monetarily from getting more shit built. And that's regardless of whether or not it tears apart neighborhoods, regardless of whether it leaves people houseless when these new luxury market rate condos go up 
that raise the cost of living for everyone around them because that's the type of building that developers want to build. It's a moneymaker. They're not making as much money if they decide to build affordable to most single people. Yeah, yeah, single family homes. They're making more money off of these denser luxury condo buildings, uh, as are the construction trade unions, which have often sided with YIMBYs. They're also benefiting the NIMBYs, which kind of brings us to this idea of the YIMBY being created, the Yes in My Backyard movement being created. It's a false dichotomy between YIMBYs and NIMBYs. NIMBYs stands for not in my backyard. And that's the kind of typical person who is only interested in their home values going up. And they don't want other buildings being built nearby because, you know, it, it could bring a different, a different vibe to the neighborhood. They, they're kind of like the isolationists uh, is how they're painted. So Yimbys are supposedly like the oppositional force to the NIMBYs. But in reality, there's a lot of overlap between the NIMBY, the not in my backyard person who is interested in real estate values and the YIMBY who is a shill for the real estate industry that is interested in, yes, higher property values locally. Like one can't exist without the other. Listener, if you take anything away from this episode, please know that they are both bad. A perfect example of NIMBYs is like, when everyone banded together in, I don't know, was it, it was like Sea Cliff or Pack Heights or something where they were saying that wealthy. they were, yeah, like a really wealthy neighborhood in SF. They were like going to build a houseless shelter, you know, which is a whole other thing, right? But, and then like a bunch of people in the neighborhood banded against it. And that's often used as an example for a NIMBY or something like that. Right. Um, but the fact is, is, like if you were to talk to a Yimbi, they're not, they're also not advocating for shelters. No. They're not no. advocating for these things. Like one can't exist without the other. Um, they're right. very much hand in hand. They have to operate together. The Yimbis have to point the blame somewhere in order to keep their values, their mission to build, build, build intact. Yeah, no, absolutely. I think that is a good example of the kind of overlap that you see from these groups that you know the yimbys paint in their press releases as like kind of their their enemies their foils but they're often just one and the same they're you know most interested in building these buildings that appeal to the affluent real estate investors like blackrock are pretty much the only companies that are able to get things built locally because profit is their motive and they are able to lobby the city they're able to harness these fake grassroots yimbies that show up to city council meetings and force and have this huge like presence on the internet they'll come after you if you say anything that's oppositional to their trickle down idea their reaganomics uh, under which they're only interested in building more luxury hondos you know, at the end of the day, all these people are are interested in, in profit, and it's really like a greed-run system. Sonia starts showing up to the SF Planning Commission meetings coming from Oakland. This is 2014, where she has a story that she's this poor teacher who's pissed off about how expensive rent is. Ostensibly, she's showing up to these meetings, which are usually during the day in her free time, cultivating this false image as just another pissed off renter like you and me. It's this grassroots image that later, you know, is Yimby Movement's larger blueprint. And of course, as mentioned, Sonia is coming from a family of landlords. Uh, right. Like the else? call is coming from inside the house. <laughs> <laughs> Not to mention today and soon after she arrived 
she was getting most of her funding from tech companies like Yelp, Microsoft, PayPal. And there were a lot of rich people soon throwing money at uh, the idea. And also the press, which if uh, people don't know, a lot of local press is dependent on advertising of real estate like real estate is where they are getting the biggest contracts for advertisers and so that's why you have these real estate sections in whatever newspapers are left in print but also online there's you know plenty of of large real estate oriented websites and also within like news media Real estate is a major beat, I guess you would say. There's always like a few uh, real estate reporters where, you know, you, you might not have a labor reporter at a newspaper or uh, a news website, but you're always probably going to have uh, somebody whose duty it is to cover the real estate industry, of course, because if, if these news organizations are getting all of this funding from the real estate industry, they're going to speak positively about, or they're not going to want to push the envelope too, too much in terms yeah, of like, like negative press. Yeah. Like you totally can't bite the hand that's feeding you. Right. Um, and it's really interesting when you talk about, um, you know, the press side and in its involvement with the real estate industry. It makes me really think that Sonia Trouse has this Elizabeth Holmes. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's like her success story, but except Sonia Trouse is, you know, not totally fucking exiled from society yet. Everybody ate up what Sonia had to say about housing. Never oh, mind yeah. the fact that she comes from a family of landlords. Never mind the fact that she is just like prior to coming to San Francisco, known for being just a shitty fucking person. <laughs> and everybody just ran with it. Probably right. because she's a woman, probably because she's a girl boss, probably because she made being so fucking classist and horrible trendy. Yeah, she definitely fed off of all of those things. And certainly like the real estate funded politicians, the real estate funded media, they were more than willing to jump on board and help her achieve her dream of seeing more luxury condos built in San Francisco. The ease with which she was able to insert herself into local politics she soon you know ran for a local office like a supervisor position i do remember like when she was campaigning she was definitely playing to all those things like you know she's she's a woman she i don't know if she was a mom at that point in time but since Didn't then everyone she's... also think that she was black well yeah i was gonna get to that exactly yeah 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 yeah. i mean i remember having a conversation out on the street with somebody where we were having a discussion about uh, you know it was a day before the election i never do this i'm not trying to canvas for or against local politicians who <laughs> are ultimately just so slippery but i did go out with some people who were trying to get anybody but sonia in that position, I, I definitely had some conversations with people who were like, ah, you know, I thought there was like, she has to have like one drop in her. Um, oh my God, that's so horrible. <laughs> yeah, no, it was, it was like, Jeez. wow. Like she's presenting herself in this certain way. And I mean, I guess, I guess I could see it. She's, you know, the lightest skin. <laughs> isn't Black she it's like italian known. x is she italian? Uh, i believe that she is of austrian descent okay don't okay. quote me on that but <laughs> uh yeah i haven't actually looked into her family tree <laughs> unfortunately because the news media is so sort of dependent on real estate and of course a lot of journalists themselves 
are of a class where maybe they can afford a home. Uh, you don't necessarily get into journalism having, you know, someone who's worked in journalism for about 15 years. A lot of people are not really connected with people who don't make above a certain amount or who did not go to a liberal arts school and then on to get a master's later on. And so you have a sort of like elite group of people who are reporters. And so, of course, like they're going to share like social circles with the MBs. They're also going to be more on board with the MB ideas because the person who pays the bills, like the real estate industry, the people who spend the most in advertising locally, they are into this, this new movement. And so Yimby has become the voice that the media goes to for quotes anytime the media is talking about housing activism, quote unquote, housing activism. Which is so fucked up because like, fair warning, we're gonna be talking about Yimby's and Yimby's forever yeah you know, that's true yeah it, sorry about it sorry not sorry you like yimbyism as like an idea is so rooted in very racist housing policies it's blatantly obvious like when you uh, talk against yimbyism online you're not getting backlash and harassment from just the yimbies in your local area you're getting them from everywhere uh, like Norway yeah. and shit. And the fact that the people who uphold Yimbyism, who are on the fence about it, who are all about it and don't stop talking about it, the fact that they have become this voice for housing justice and how much they've co-opted the language, it's like, it is laughable, but it's also just deeply fucked up um, because they are intentionally trying to ruin the lives of the people that they are ruining. Yeah, and I wish that we'd actually started with that part because that is the part that I think is most notable and tends to be the thing I worry the most about when Yimbyism goes to another city is just this, like the pretense around it, like the false, the faux aggressiveness of this movement because they really do like they use all the right lingo they talk about housing providers and they talk mm -hmm. about oh you know maybe like rent control as a stopgap solution is fine and like there's so many things that we can we can agree on the yimbys have just so many more resources behind them so much more money they are just you know interested in accumulating wealth before people they're interested in buildings before people mm -hmm. if, if there was one thing that i would say like you know take away from this it's that message that yimbys they've been pretty good as you know many of them come from public relations and, and marketing teams like they are schooled in how to co-opt like you said a like certain language and the language of the pre-MB housing movement. So, you know, talking about things in terms of how it will benefit like lower income people, even if the claims that they make about that are totally baseless or false and misleading. Uh, you know, another thing that I feel like just you can tell a EMB from anyone else is like the, the tone, that tone that Sonia has, where it's just, it, it does feel like very only child energy like, <laughs> <you> <laughs> that's <are> <laughs> so oh my god I was an only child for a very long time that's a little I'm I'm offended I, you know I, I, yeah, no, I don't, no offense to, to only children but it, it's yeah no it's more like just this idea that you are you're the only one you're yeah the only yeah, one that matters yeah I, I, I get it I get it maybe maybe that hit a little too close to home I get it I get it so <laughs> you're yeah you're you're right all the time. <laughs> I don't know if that's how you felt like growing up and you know the people around you talking about Sonia uh, <laughs> would, might be like 
you know, you, you might condescend, you might tell them you're too stupid to understand how development and the price of housing works and why public housing is a bad idea. Everything's so complicated. And the answer is really simple. You know, it's supply and demand. And if we just like deregulated the system, there's too many laws protecting low income people. If we let the free market decide there would be enough housing for everyone. That's like so fucking silly to me. That's like Disney villain type shit to let the free market decide. And yeah. like people just eat it. People just eat that shit and they spread it like wildfire. In she came this- to town as a libertarian and she was writing for the local libertarian newsletter, the, the newsletter of the San Francisco Libertarians. It definitely, yeah, I mean, it felt like here's another person who is an avowed libertarian, but at the same time is really into, you know, the tax breaks that construction trades and the developers tend to get and like lowering the cost for developers as much as possible at the expense of the government, basically, and people who pay taxes into that government. Developers are usually getting subsidized in in various ways. It does behoove them to keep housing scarce. So it's not like they're trying to lower costs. They're not like, even though we're headed into this recession in 2022, there is some movement in the housing market that maybe prices will go down a bit, but not down enough to make housing, if the IMBs or if the developers have anything to say about it, it's not going to go down enough to where the landlords are going to have to lose too much money. And you saw like these avowed libertarians, like these, a lot of these landlords who benefited so much from, for example, the pandemic. I mean, it was really like this crisis capitalism basically being able to get bailed out by the government under the guise of we're trying to keep people in their homes instead of giving money directly to renters renters they're directing that money to the landlords but at the same time you had all of these landlords and you still have all of these landlords who are acting like victims from that time because the of the eviction moratoriums right that really served them because there would be so many landlords with empty properties if we're going to talk about you know the mom and pop landlords that the yimbies always like to trot out that might have had trouble renting their places for what they were getting pre-pandemic um, luckily, the government stepped in and paid the bills for a couple of years. They don't want to like set a precedent at the end of the day. They don't want to uh, make it seem like housing is getting too much more affordable because housing is more profitable to them if it's expensive. There is a sort of positive for developers and landlords to show that housing is rare. And it's what EMBs are always saying. It's like, we need to build more. There's not enough housing. Even though we have these numbers about like 61,000 homes empty in San Francisco, they are not interested in hearing that or hearing the logic behind those arguments because they make more money if housing is a rare commodity. Is it just the housing crisis that they say that there's a... Do you know what I'm talking about? Housing crisis, affordability, like there's a lot of words that we talk about when we're talking about housing that they have kind of twisted previous definitions of, I would say. I don't yeah. know if that's the the term that you're looking for, uh, but certainly the housing crisis is a crisis of unaffordability for the vast majority of people. And the housing crisis is something that is not going to be fixed by letting developers, you know, more easily build luxury condos by, you know, getting rid of laws that protect renters 
and deregulating where within the city is like a environmentally fit place to even build a new building. Yimbyism, it's not a new concept. It's just like this fake grassroots cover for yeah. the real estate industry. Like what they feed off of to keep operating, you know, like just totally using using like phrases like the housing crisis and just doing like twisting it up saying like there's not enough housing there's not enough housing there's not enough housing the people who are saying there's not enough housing are literally the people profiting off of just like these massive condos and in that same breath like just buying up tons of single family homes that also sit empty for the same reason you know yeah. the these people are organizing. Uh, they are creating factions in other cities and are so chronically online and mm -hmm. uh, are so heavily funded to deliver this message that they need to keep doing what the fuck they're th that they're doing. Um, right. And like the little that people understand, the more beneficial it is for them to keep doing. Oh, that. absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, no. And so they use these these terms like uh yeah like housing for all and you hear a lot of their the names of their organizations and you're like oh that sounds sweet like east bay for everyone right. was one where the the president who was later put on on leave because she was doxing people that were not down with the yimbi ethos and were saying so on twitter or what have you she told me directly that it would take about 30 years for the trickle down to happen. It's just like the height of absurdity to like <laughs> tell somebody who's having trouble, like struggling to make rent or is houseless. Like you just got to wait 30 years and then these luxury condos will become affordable to you or they will, uh, They'll make it so that the buildings next to them are affordable to you or whatever their their logic is all couched in this language that again is has this like social justice -y vibe when i met one of the local yimbies when i met him he was evangelizing about uh, mission yimby which was like a micro yimby group that was just in the mission district hyper local he was taking a sabbatical from Google, obviously, to help uh, with Sonia Trauss's campaign. He was complaining about like what he called racist verbal attacks by Latinx people who were doing tenant organizing the mission that they had been doing for years. And then here comes like this white dude from Google who gets a sabbatical so that he can like spend his days working on the campaign of a a friend of his, Sonia Trous, they were trying to like become the voice of, of the housing movement there in the mission. Later, he led what was called Yimby neoliberal meetings oh. at the Yimby HQ, SF Yimby HQ in, in Soma in that headquarters. It was, it's the same space that Yimby socialist meetings were being held at the time. You can't make this shit up. Like, yeah, you can't. <laughs> yeah, I mean, just really trying to, like, play to all sides. And I guess, you know, if, if you say it enough, if you say, like, we need to build more because building more will trickle down. And I don't know, it, it becomes implanted in people's heads is, is the idea. It's I guess that's, like, not not great way to sum up some of the the tenets of the psychology behind advertising is just if you hammer it into people's heads enough, maybe they'll start to believe it and embrace it. What is it like? You have to hear a word like 27 times before you like buy something. Something like that. Yeah, yeah. And so, but you know, you, you hear you be socialist enough. Maybe you start to think, oh, you know, we're living in San Francisco where people are open to this idea of socialism, maybe not so much on the like uh, at the city hall level, but certainly it sounds nice. Maybe I'm just digging in my brain a little bit too hard, but I really feel like EMBs think that their platform, because it's so 
quote unquote like all encompassing like you can be like a democratic yimby you can be a yimby socialist you can be a neoliberal yimby and of course there's tons of right-wing yimbies like it, i swear like i bet you they probably think so highly of their organizations because they have this um reach that can surpass politics and i think that's such a neoliberal way to look at it that you can basically just unite despite politics to move capital forward you'll meet yimbies who are against capitalism which is so wild anarchists who don't even question the politics of yimbyism what really grinds my gears is that all of these people uh the people that uphold it the people who are on the fence about it the people that um make space for yimbies are all people who think that um they know better yeah. than the people who have dealt with the shit who have lived in the city who have been displaced from the city or in other places right the yimbies truly believe that they are the authoritative source on this shit uh right and most of the time they're white they're in tech uh they have money they come from wealth they come from a real estate background they are a real estate agent like mm -hmm. if you do see somebody yeah, who's not white that's a yimby I guarantee you, it's like I mean, a soapbox. Not a, not a plant, but like it's right. sort of a, you have to think like, wow, this person has been misled, turned around, or maybe not. Maybe they are just that self-loathing that mm -hmm, mm -hmm. they're willing to be trotted out as the Indies do because it is a kind of shockingly white movement. And of course it's, you know, movement of uh, mostly rich people and so if you like have a, a visible disability, if you are Asian, if you are like, I don't know, something makes you like visibly queer or trans, they are going to jump on you. They're going to yeah. make you run for local city council. They will use you in the same way that people like Scott Wiener, who is a very big proponent of Yimby's will tout the fact that he is gay and is Jewish. Yeah, um, exactly. Very similar to how Sonia Trauss will play into the fact that she is a woman, girl boss, blah, blah, blah. It's all rooted in the same thing, to use what makes you special, what makes you um, different, or actually not even special, because like, fuck identity politics, but to use your identity for profit, essentially. Right. Not even your own profit profit on behalf of developers <laughs> right yeah no and in many cases it's like these people who are standing yimbis who aren't benefiting directly because they're they've been hired and are paid by peter thiel or jeremy stoppelman of yelp it's sad to see people get used in that way yeah i We'll throw up on the Patreon. There's a pretty good image of Scott Wiener, who was one of the keynote speakers at the first Yimby Town conference, where Yimby's basically had to import their only uh, black speaker, which was this urban planner from Texas, who I did try to contact at one point. And I, we've kind of covered a lot of ins and outs of what. I have come to understand the Yimby movements and Yimbys to sort of present themselves as over the past few years of writing too many articles about them and getting doxxed by them. One thing I didn't mention, one thing that really got me, I think it was 2020, they were to have the Yimby Town Conference. It was gonna be in Portland that year the website i'm guessing it's still there if so i can grab a screenshot but at the top they had a land dedication oh my god which just felt like the the height of hypocrisy and of course there's the immigrant narrative that that sonia uses that i guess we didn't discuss here right now today but yeah it's pretty pretty intense to basically what she did at city council that was 
briefly, like a blip in the local news was call all of the Latinx people who were organizing against a building that would certainly be unaffordable for people who lived in the Mission District and would cause more displacement in the Mission District. She came in, she was supporting it at City Hall, Sonia, and she turned around and was like, I have to say, this is a very Trumpian crowd. You're all sounding very xenophobic and like anti-immigrant is basically the gist of her argument was like, because I am a wealthy landlord's daughter from the posher part of Philadelphia, and you're not welcoming me here, you are akin to, you know, the president who is famous for his build the wall rhetoric, even though arguably, like we have a lot of Democrats that are also down with that. This is the kind of stuff that comes out of this woman's mouth. The way that she talks about people and usually poor people, brown people, black people, um, people um, on the streets, the way that she talks about them is so, it's just like there's such an air of entitlement. It's the privilege of people who believe that they're victims and, you know, immigrants in need of compassion and they need like the free labor of volunteers to join the movement and have never been told no. It's a cliche of, excuse you know, me for the, the, yeah, the, the, only, the child only child syndrome. I get it. I see yeah. it. I get it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, they're just not used to hearing no. And that's why, I mean, when I wrote a piece for the Seattle Weekly, which isn't even like the largest alternative weekly in Seattle, there was a local Yimby who said that for this small article that I'd written had like set back the local Yimby movement two years, which to which I was, you know, kind of stoked. She also, you, you know, should be talked proud. To- <laughs> you should be so proud. <laughs> Absolutely. No, it was it was very it was sweet of her to note that. I mean, she said that she would be (laughs) crying and then there were a bunch of like response pieces from people who clearly had a lot of time to devote to writing these uh, screeds where they were like trying to pick apart this piece that I wrote. Piece was less than a thousand words, you know, a couple columns in this weekly paper. And yet that level of criticism even was too much for them to to take. So if you criticize EMB logic and you have any kind of audience, just be prepared because they will come for you. There's definitely a lot of groups on the internet, EMB groups that are at the ready to come out. They're not all bots either. They are definitely organized online to come and shoot down any critique it doesn't even matter what time of day it is i've seen some yimby reply guys just completely harass people for three weeks and longer like this isn't a joke it's definitely affected the way that public comment is going oh yeah there have been tons of fights with yimbys and organizers in the bay specifically around like tearing down schools and putting up condos people outside of the city, the county, wherever these meetings are, these uh, council meetings are being held, uh, they will show up from anywhere. They Mm -hmm. will show up internationally, nationally um, to have a say on this property that they don't own, that they don't live nearby, that they don't care for. It's all part of their, their strategy, which is basically just fucking harassment. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, no, it is. It is very like akin to Zionism in that way. Yeah. And I do actually remember that they did try to get me fired. So that was one thing. Yeah, I was going to say I could have sworn uh, it got a little gnarly. Right. Like, yeah, well, with one of the pieces that I wrote, one of the first pieces that I wrote with my friend Andrew, it's like an online kind of lefty site called Truth Out. 
And at the time I was like a contributing writer and I was writing quite a bit for them. They deluged the editorial board with comments. They called for my firing. They did end up getting truth out to change the title of the article which for people that don't know like journalists generally don't title their pieces anyways uh in this case i think i did though and it was a very good one thanks it, the sub subtitle originally it was the the neoliberal darlings of the real estate industry mm. and I guess enough people complained about like being named neoliberal. And this was prior to the advent of the actual subgroup neoliberal Yimby led by Steph <laughs> Stephen Buss. So uh, it, it wasn't part of the Yimby lexicon yet, but yeah, they, they did change the title. It's not like I, uh, I suffered the, the, the real stakes around this are whether or not you have a house to, to live in, whether or not you are precariously housed, like, or what have you, whatever the, the latest term is for subsistence living and not, you know, like wondering if you will be able to, to make rent. They will come for your job. They will come for the titles of your articles. <laughs> they will. <laughs> Make sure that uh, you have a hard time making rent because they are only interested in promoting the most expensive, the most inaccessible to most people type of condo development. This episode of San Francisco was produced by Toshio Moronic and Caitlin Wood. If you can, please help us out by going to sadfrancis.co where you can contribute toward the editing and transcriptions of the show. In exchange, you'll get bonus episodes and more. Again, that's sadfrancis.co, S-A-D-F-R-A-N-C-I-S dot C-O for more.